discipline, starting at verse 5. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Verse 9. Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart. So doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. The Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Thank you for your reverence to God's word. Father, I thank you today for your grace, your mercy toward us. I thank you that you fashioned the truth in flesh and made him to live among us so that we could see his true nature. I thank you for Jesus, who is the way, the truth, the life. I pray that as your word comes forward today, that you would clarify your will in our hearts, that we might serve you better. In Jesus' name, I ask you for this. Amen. This morning, I want to talk to you about, well, telling the truth. Just telling the truth. Specifically, telling a hard truth. A truth that's difficult to share because of how it may or may not be received by someone else. And so that's why we title it Heart Truth for or From Tender Hearts. Heart Truth from Tender Hearts. Now, by way of introducing this, I'll talk to you about my coffee habit. Some of you know I have a coffee habit. Uh, that's a nice way of saying I'm addicted, completely addicted. Um, I like my coffee with a lot of cream and sugar. In fact, if you ever saw me prepare my coffee, you wouldn't say that I put cream and sugar in my coffee. You would say I put coffee in my cream and sugar, yeah. if you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. I hear assistant pastor, Pastor Whit behind me, a man who drinks black, uh, black coffee, so he thinks he's superior to me, but he's not. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so I, I, I essentially water my coffee down. That's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm watering it down. Um, I like dark roast coffee. For those of you who know what that is, you know, you've got light roast, you've got medium roast, and then you've got French coffee, dark roast coffee. I actually prefer the bolder, nuttier flavor of a good French roast coffee, which absolutely does me no good since I put so much cream and sugar in it. But it is what it is. I have, to, I have to do that to coffee to consume it. I can't drink it straight. It's, it's just too bitter for me. It's too difficult to consume that way, so I have to doctor it. And I admit, that's what I'm doing. I'm doctoring it. And when I think about what I do to coffee, I also think about sometimes what I do to my conversation with other people. Just the way I dilute coffee. Sometimes when I'm talking to other people, I sweeten my conversation. I water it down to take the bitterness out of it. And sometimes in doing so, I'm actually shrinking from the boldness of truth. Sometimes I'm holding back on delivering the full truth. Now, I know I'm not the only one in the room who has done that or maybe who does that, who does not tell someone the undoctored, unadulterated truth for fear it might fill in the blank, offend them, upset them, send them away, break them down. We have good reasons for not telling people the truth. At least we think they are good reasons. We don't want our conversations to be uncomfortable. We want them to be non-threatening. We want to save ourselves from conflict. I mean, decent people don't live for conflict. We, we don't want to argue with folks. We don't want to fuss and fight with folks. We, and, and look, by the way, we want people to like us. And sometimes when you tell somebody the truth, you risk them not liking you very much. And so we serve our coffee with cream 
and sugar. Famous playwright once said that uh, good friends stab each other in the front. I'll let that soak in. Good friends stab each other in the front. Sometimes we will tell that hard truth to other people, <laughs> except the person to whom it applies, right? We'll tell our good friends that truth. We'll tell our spouse, our girlfriend, our boyfriend that truth. We'll tell uninterested uninvested others that truth. We'll tell people on the job that truth. We'll tell people at the school that truth. We'll tell people in the marketplace and on the street that, on the street that truth. We'll tell everybody that truth, except the person to whom it applies, because we don't want the conflict. And yet the scripture tells us we should know the truth and the truth, it's the truth, it's the truth that makes us <laughs> Amen. God needs some of us to set some people free. So, Pastor, what do I do? What, if I, what do I do if I'm one of those people who may be what we call conflict averse? We don't like rubbing folks the wrong way. We don't have an appetite for clashing with others. It, it genuinely makes us nervous. We're genuinely uncomfortable sharing a difficult truth with other people. What do I, what do, I do about that? I mean, it, you know, did you ever know something in your head was right, but you couldn't get your body to do it? You know in your head and in your heart that something's right to do, but that old body just, you can't get that body to do it. You can't get that mouth to do it. You can't get those hands and those feet to go there. But you, and it's just killing you. It's keeping you up at night. You're wrestling with the thing. But you can't make that next step, or at least you think you can't. Well, I am going to do right now what I'm asking you to do, which is I'm going to share a hard truth with you. And my hope is that you will receive that truth as it's given and use it to change your life. Now, I'm also going to tell you what you should know when you tell the truth to others, which is you cannot control people's response to the truth. Amen. I'm going to show you how Jesus handled this by the end of this sermon, because Jesus had the same issue. He would tell the truth to folks and they wouldn't respond, but it didn't stop him from telling the truth. And you might be shocked when I start to talk to you about the folks that he told the truth to and how blunt he was, how straightforward he was. Because sometimes when you use too many words, you complicate the truth. And the truth is simple. That's why in court they tell you to tell the whole truth. Anybody ever, ever, anybody ever watch Dragnet? I'm looking around. Some of y'all watch Dragnet, y'all. The first run episodes, by the way. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Remember what the detective would say? Just the... Amen. Just the facts, ma'am. He'd stand at the door and say, just the facts. I don't want all the extra stuff. So I'm going to give you three, three things for you to consider. And by the way, when I say you, I'm including myself in you. I'm not superior in this. Some of you have told me, Pastor, you're blunt, you're straightforward, I've gotten all kinds of adjectives. Trust me, there are times when I am not as blunt as I wish to be. I, I, I pull back. Amen. I'm not trying to break you. And there are some times I pull back and I shouldn't. Because just like you, I'm inclined to be that person who wants everybody to like them. And sometimes I, I just get tired of being the person who is that person. So the first thing I tell myself is what I'm going to tell you is, remember, we all need grace. Yeah. 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 Pastor, what are you talking about? We all need grace. 
Galatians 6.1. Galatians 6.1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, in the spirit of meekness. And it's the next part that catches me. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And then verse 2 in that says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so fulfill the law of Christ. Remember, we all need grace. These streets have laws. There are laws in these streets. And depending on where you are and who you are and what's going on, one of those laws is mind your own business. Mind your own business. Don't stand still too long and don't look too hard. Keep it moving. But in the kingdom, your business is my business. Especially when your business puts you in peril of eternal condemnation. Now, I don't mean getting in your business for the sake of getting in your business. But if I see my brother, my sister going down, your business becomes my business. And now I'm in the restoration business. And the clause that tells me how to do it, that is to have this spirit of lowliness, of meekness, tells me why I should be that way. Think about yourself, Carnell. You're not better. I don't go to other folks and tell them truths about their lives because I'm better than them. I'm not better. None of us are better than anybody else. I'm standing on this slightly higher platform wearing this black suit on first Sunday, which often gives me an air of superiority somehow, or somehow I stand higher, or I serve a higher standard. No, we're all in this together. The God that I serve is the God that you serve. And that God's standard is the same on me as it is on you. I'm not better. My struggles aren't any less than yours. And if Jesus was tempted, you better know I am. I'll say it again. If Jesus was tempted, you better know I am. So when I share truths, I have to remember, I too am an heir of grace. I too am benefited by God's favor, undeserved favor, unearned kindness. I'm just a beggar coming to you, another beggar, telling you where I found bread. But I'm not the baker. And so when we go to each other, when we come to each other, we have to remember we all need grace. All of us need grace, in particular God's saving grace. And I want you to consider this, that sometimes you might be the only one bold enough, anointed enough informed, wise enough, strong enough to deliver that truth. Instead of assuming, well, somebody will tell her that she talks too much. Somebody will tell him that he's sharing information that's not his to share. Somebody will tell him that they're offensive. Yeah. You. You're going to tell them because you are watching your brother. You are watching your sister go down in flames. And as you're watching them, it is now your turn to become a firefighter and to put that fire out. It's not anybody else's job. It's your job. Hold on. Let me qualify this. It's your job if you're spiritual. If you're carnal, keep your mouth shut. Don't share nothing with nobody. Do what Jesus said do. Get in that upper room and wait for the spirit to come. But if you are spiritually mature, if you've had some faith fights, 
if you've learned some things by the counsel of the Holy Ghost, it becomes your job to share that wisdom with others. We're truth tellers. So consider yourself. That can be you. If the truth be told, at one point that was you. We all need grace. Number two, resist the urge towards self-protection. Resist the urge toward self-protection. Now, number one was this, this idea that sometimes we forget that all of us have struggled with sin on some level at some point in some area. And we all needed God's grace. We forget that. Sometimes our lives get, and I've preached a sermon on this, sometimes our lives get so programmed and so routine and our days look so much alike, we forget that we need God's grace. Our lives are set on autopilot and we feel like I never do nothing wrong. I treat my neighbor right. I never talk out of turn. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory. Repentance isn't just for the unbeliever. It's also for the believer. The second point really is about this idea of protecting myself from conflict, protecting myself from the judgment of others, protecting myself from the backlash that might come when I tell this hard truth. Resist the urge towards self-protection. 16th Psalm, Psalm 16, verses 8 and 9 says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. In other words, I'm straight. I'm right. God's got me. Let's move it. Let's move it. Let's go do it. Let's go do it. I'm not scared. I'm not shaken. God's got me. This is my job. I, I have to do what I'm about to do because I love this brother. I love this sister. And it's my job to see them restored. And I'm not going to worry about the impact to me because my soul dwells secure in the Lord. God's got me. Whatever the fallout, God's got me. I am not going to stand here and say to you that sometimes when you share the truth with people, there won't be fallout because there will be fallout. There will be some relationships that are fractured, even broken and severed. That cannot be a reason not to tell somebody the truth. Jesus was an example for us in all things, and he laid down his very life for his friends. But the very life he laid down, that sacrifice was not immediately appreciated. Romans chapter 5 reminds us of, of that. God demonstrated his love. He commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to get our act together. They say, oh, Lord, I need you. I appreciate you. Okay, I'll die for you now. No. He died for the ones who gambled for his clothes. He died for the ones who drove nails in his hands and in his feet. He died for the one who, who pierced his side with that spear. He died for those who, who whipped him and beat him and spat upon him and punched him in the garden. He died for them who scurrilously blasphemed his father's name. He died for who for the joy that was set before him, despising the shame, he endured death, even the death of the cross. I am not saying to you that it's difficult to have people walk away from you because you're telling them what is right. It is difficult for anybody in the building who's ever been a victim of my truth telling. Please understand when I see you anguished in your eyes because of what I share with you, it brings me no special joy. There are times when I preach from this sacred desk and I'm sharing something that's not the rah rah message. I'd love to stand before you and do what so many other lying preachers in the world do 
and say to you that this is the year of your prosperity. It ain't. It ain't. Until you stop your undisciplined spending, you will never have a year of prosperity. This is the year of your healing. It ain't. It ain't. You consume too much saturated fat, too much sugar, too much salt. This is not the year of your healing. Your body will never heal until you treat it right. It ain't. This is the year of your promotion. It ain't. If you keep showing up for work late and not doing your job right, you will not get promoted. This is not about some supernatural advancement of your personal cause. You've got to do the right thing. And that's the truth I'm going to tell you. For those of you who don't tithe, you're still struggling with it. And you're also struggling financially. You're never going to be blessed because you're cursed with the curse. It ain't. It ain't. I can't counsel you out of that. I get it. We want to self-protect. I'd love to be able to preach to you a message to have you standing and clapping your hands, but this is 2019 and the world's a very dark place and it's my job to call you out of that darkness into his marvelous light. I've got to draw the line clearly on the ground. This is God's side. That's the other side. Choose you this day who you will serve. In a world that wants you to fill you with sugar and cream, it's my job to give you the real coffee. Amen. The unadulterated, undiluted stuff. The French roast. The bold flavor. Amen. Amen. Resist the urge to self-protect. Don't worry about the fallout. Pastor, that's easier said than done. I understand that. But we don't walk according to the counsel of the flesh. We walk by the spirit. That's where Christ makes us free in the spirit. No, we're not bold naturally, perhaps in the flesh, but we can be bold in the spirit. And the psalmist tells us that our flesh is secure in God. He will protect us. And whatever we lose for the sake of Christ, we were never meant to have. Some relationships aren't worth maintaining. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Number three, finally, respect God's glory over any others. Respect God's glory over any others. Isaiah 42, 8, I am the Lord. I love this verse. Elder Witt quotes it all the time. I am the Lord. Then he says, that is my name. God is just awesome. I am the Lord. That is my name and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Respect God's glory over any others. We're trying to we're trying to preserve other people's sense of self-concept. Let me let me just clue you into what self-concept is. Self-concept is a term that refers to how we Think about ourselves. All of us have self-concept. All of you see yourself a certain way. You see yourself as having certain strengths and weaknesses, attributes, traits, talents, gifts. Sometimes we're wrong about that. Sometimes our self-concept's just a little off. And sometimes we'll look at somebody who sees themselves a certain way, and we want, we, we want to tell them that mm, you're not as organized as you think you are. You're not as smart as you think you are. You're not as talented. Have you ever had anybody say, you know, they've been talked up, like people come and say, that person can sing really well. That person can sing. You ought to hear them sing. And then you go to them and say, yeah, I've been singing a long time, okay. And then you hear the singing and you go, oh, 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 no. Self-concept. Sometimes our self-concept is off. And we want to so preserve that person's sense of themselves because it's high. They have a high sense of themselves. We, we so want to preserve that. We don't want to interrupt that. And yet, they're not walking in truth. 
Now, I'm not saying go to somebody and say you can't sing. That was maybe a weak example, but my point is you get it. Sometimes people aren't right in their own, what they see in their own eyes. And we so want to preserve that. But, but, but here's the thing. Our highest duty is to glorify God, not others. And sometimes we're so wanting to glorify others, we cease to glorify God. God's glory must always be our priority. And God glory is in the truth. So we must live in truth. Amen. And he will not share his glory with another. Let me show you how Jesus does it. Remember earlier I told you as we're wrapping up, remember earlier I told you, I'm going to show you how Jesus models truth telling and its priority in our lives. And Mark 7, Jesus tells the truth to the Pharisees. In fact, he takes the first 23 verses of Mark 7 and he breaks down the areas where they're just failing. They were Pharisees. He was a lowly rural rabbi. Okay. They were Pharisees. He was a lowly rural rabbi. And yet he's talking to them about how they violate God's laws. Who is he to tell them? They're the most learned people in the land. And yet he tells them the truth. Amen? Amen. He teaches us how to tell truth to power. Tell truth to power. Mm -hmm. I have an issue with every preacher who's ever walked into a president's office. I don't care if it was Obama or Trump and left that office without telling them the truth. God's word is the standard. We stand on that. That's all we represent. That's all we represent. At the end of the day, when we talk about community empowerment and all that stuff, all that's great. But the land's going to hell. Literally. This land is going to hell. Literally. Look at what's happening. You've had administrations. I'm about to get in trouble for telling the truth. See, this is one of these moments where I just like to walk away from this sermon right now and have a benediction and go right to communion. But ah, I get stuck talking about this stuff. Lord, help me, Jesus. You've had administrations who have advocated for late term abortions at a point where you can look at a picture and see a baby smiling and wiggling his or her little fingers. And you have the nerve of people saying, that's not life. God called my name before I was formed in my mother's belly. You've got administrations who are more interested and preserving the image of a nation than people's personal dignities. You've got children right now sleeping in cages, and I don't care what they call them. Mm, mm, mm. Mm. Don't let me go to Trump's office. There ain't no way I can hold my peace. I don't care what you called me there to meet about. We got to talk about this stuff. Why babies sleeping in cages? This ain't got nothing to do with immigration and, and getting in the country legally. Baby ought not sleep in cages. Period. End of discussion. And yet there are Christians in this land. We're on the president's side. Just like during Obama's administration when he was advocating for late term abortion and black Christians were on his side and refused to speak out against it. I'm sorry. Wrong is wrong. I don't care who the president is. They're all pharaoh. Mm. God ordains government for one thing. Protect the people and advocate that they do right toward one another. That's Paul in the book of Romans. Read it. Everything else is extra. And Lord knows we're doing a lot of extra in the world right now. Not just this country, but in the world right now. And how can a Christian 
not tell truth to power. Unless you get right, you're going to hell. And everybody with you, everybody who marches with you going to hell too. All y'all just going to go right into hell with your little political agendas. Bust it wide open. How do we as Christians not tell that truth? Even when folks are on our side. Jesus tells truth to power. Yes, you're in charge of our religious system. Yes, you sit higher than me in church government. But the truth be told, y'all ain't right, Jesus said to them. Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 23. Read it yourself. Folks in charge ain't always right. I ain't always right. Yeah, I said it. I'm not always right. Jesus. Tells truth to the religious. And that's not just the Pharisees and people in charge. He's talking to everybody in the church in Matthew 8 when he contrasts the Roman centurion's faith with the religious people's faith. Here this man had faith for the healing of his child and he wasn't even an official member of our religious club. And yet he went to Jesus because he knew where his help came from. All the rest of them didn't know to do that. Amen. Their loved ones were at home dying. And there even occurred to them, maybe Jesus can come by and put his hands on them. So Jesus would even tell the truth to church folk. Sort of like I'm doing right now. Uncomfortable. I so want Sister Borden to go start the car so that when church is over, I can jump in it and go home. But we got to tell the truth to each other right here in the church. Jesus tells the truth to those who are rocked by catastrophe. Many had died in this local tragedy and Jesus had been made aware of it. And when he spoke to them, he says these words to them. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Wait a minute, Jesus. These people are mourning. They've suffered this great loss. Shouldn't you be telling them it's going to be all right? It's going to be okay? Jesus didn't do that. He said, look at what happened. That happened for a reason. And if y'all don't get right, it's going to happen to you. Amen. And I want to tell the church in the United States of America, we get on Europe because of their increasing secularization. The fact that the churches in Europe now are becoming museums and bookstores they're making them condos and stuff like that because ain't nobody going to church. And in America, they go, godless, godless Europeans. Hello, America. Is, is this all? Hello, America. Unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And that goes for a lot of folks in the church, too. Fortunately, it won't happen. On that good getting up morning, we, don't, we won't know anything about what's happening in hell. That's the good news. The good news is whatever's going down in hell, you'll never know anything about it if you're redeemed. But if you could just peek, if you could just peek into hell at that moment when judgment's going down, we'll see a lot of familiar people. And they'll be familiar because we fellowshiped with them. Going to church don't make you save like sitting in the garage don't make you a car. It just doesn't work that way. And that's the truth. That's the truth. Jesus says, I know this is hard. I know you're crying and you're mourning and you're scared. But I want you to take a look at what happened to those folks. Because if you don't get right, it's going to happen to you too. I love this last note that I made to myself. Jesus tells the truth to his mother. Who in the wedding at Cana says to him, go ahead, turn this water into wine. And he says to his mother, it's not my time. And I don't have authority in these things. Now, yes, he does. He does go on to turn the water into wine because that's what good sons do. They make their mothers happy. But the truth still had to be told. You're jumping the gun. I know you're excited for me to do the savior thing, but I have some other stuff I have to do first, like get baptized, like fast and prepare for my ministry. 
I haven't done that stuff yet. Let's not jump the gun. Yes, Jesus tells his mother an inconvenient truth. And sometimes we have to tell those closest to us. You know you ain't right. Not only did he tell his mother the truth, he told his closest brother in the truth, James and John, jockeying for position in the kingdom. He said, y'all ain't ready for this. I'm talking about telling an inconvenient truth to those who are the closest to us. When you see people going wrong, don't just go along. He tells the truth to his disciples several times when he chastises them for their lack of faith. Have you been so long with me and still struggle to believe me? And don't you know that that's the message that a lot of us need to hear? You've been in church this long and you still can't trust God for the simplest stuff. I'd love to pray with you. But nothing's going to happen until you pray for yourself. Sometimes you need to tell people that. Would you pray for me? You know what? I'd rather pray with you. I'd like to know you're praying too. There's some loads I can't carry for you. When Jesus goes into the garden of Gethsemane on that Thursday, the Bible says he can only take them up to the gate. He can go to pray only by himself. There are some things that only you are going to get done in prayer time. You can ask the deaconesses and the mothers and the elders of the church and you can come to pastor and you can come to ministers. You can ask our blessed musician. You can ask all these people who you've seen around. But look, there's just some stuff that's never going to happen in your life until you get right with Christ. <laughs> and the boat's rocking and the boat's rocking and the boat's rocking and Jesus getting that deep sleep. Anybody ever been in a deep sleep? I mean, a real deep sleep. When you woke up, there had been so much time passed and you were just oblivious to everything. Did you hear those sirens? Didn't hear those sirens. Did you feel that earthquake? Didn't feel that earthquake. <laughs> out like a light, they say. Out like Jesus was out like a light. So out that the boat was rocking and taking on water and he did not wake up. You knew what woke him up? Other people's panic. Have you ever had somebody else's panic interrupt your peace? How many times are we going to let our loved ones panic, interrupt our peace before we address it? Before we turn to them and say, you know, you and I've been through this a few times. You've come to me for prayer about this same thing, but I got a problem because you're not doing anything about it. You haven't changed your behavior. You're still inducing your own trauma. We need to talk about that. Or you can self-protect, preserve their fragile ego, and let them keep going wrong. But that's the choice that you're making. You're seeing your brother or your sister completely being overtaken by bad behavior. And rather than address the bad behavior, you want to soothe their ego. It's going to be all right. I'll pray for you. Yeah, I'll pray for you. I'll pray that you be convicted of your sins. I'll pray that you see that the way you're going is wrong. I'll pray that you see that you don't have a real relationship with Jesus Christ. You're religious, but you're not saved. I, I'm going to pray for that. John 15, 13. This is it. This is my commandment that you love one another. Jesus says, as I have loved you. Jesus wants us to love one another the way he loved us. And he loved us so much that he wouldn't just let us do the wrong thing. Verse 17 in Proverbs 27. You all know it. Iron sharpens. Good friends make their friends better. 
If you're surrounded by people who drain from you and suck out of you and never give anything back to you, never increase you, never bless you, never lift you up, never inspire you to be more, never promote you, why are you surrounded by these people? Why are you always the strongest one in your group? You're in the wrong group. Hmm. I'll leave it at this. You ever been to a movie theater or somewhere that was dark for a long time, uh, you know, saw a play or something? And it was in the middle of the day, so when you walk out, you know what happens, right? When you've been in a dark place a very long time, you know what happens. The light hurts your eyes. Right? Do you never go outside anymore? No. The light hurts your eyes, but your eyes adjust. And you know how your eyes adjust? You force yourself to face the light. You blink, you squint, you rub, you simulate the darkness and then let the light come back in, and then you simulate the darkness and let the light come back in, and before you know it, you're, you're able to tolerate the light for longer periods of time until finally you are in the light. Paul says, when you come into the light, walk in the light. Live in the light. But my brothers and my sisters, somebody has to turn the light on. And just because your friends and your loved ones are blinking and squinting and simulating darkness, give them a chance to adjust to the light. I know you want to be the life of the party and they're slapping those dominoes and drinking those 40s and talking crazy and you're like, well, they're just having a good time. I'm, I'm just going to let them be. No. Give me some dominoes. Give me seven bones. I'm going to show you all how to do it. Give me seven bones. Twenty. Jesus show is good. Fifteen. Brought me out of darkness into his marvelous light. He that wins his souls must be wise. God will give you the words to say. He'll embolden your spirit and speak through you. His power will flow through you. And you will at that moment be a vessel of light. Let's stand. We talk about a lot of things. We talk about Cardassians. Right now we're talking about Nipsey Hussle, I know some of us are. Tragic situation. Constantly, every day, something's happening. And we're talking about these current events. God bless you, brother. Talking about these current events. That's what the devil wants. He wants to distract us. He wants to distract us. I need us to stay focused. We have been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. God shines his light through us. Father, I thank you for your grace and for your goodness this morning. I thank you for the power of your word. Power to transform lives. Power to show us yourself through your word. I thank you, God. I thank you that you empower us to see you through your word. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray that as your word has gone forward, that your spirit has also. And that you, as you promised, are leading and guiding us through your spirit to what is true. We know that ultimately your son is the embodiment of real truth. Help us to see Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Father, I pray that you will be glorified in these moments. In Jesus' name. You may take your seats. The altar is still open for those who want to come. Yes.